but at least we got some pins. We still have a few more safety. We're going to go ahead and begin because we want to. Jimmy, I'm delighted you're here today. This is certainly a, a day come true for me. It's taken a long time to get here, but I'm certainly glad. And I, I'll just apologize now. There are going to be a lot of people that we don't mention today because the music industry in this community is ongoing. Many of us have lived here for many years, and the music's been going on even all around us. So all of us work together, and we're so excited to be here today. It's an honor to stand before you today on this momentous occasion. This project began in 2009, and we're thrilled to see it come to completion today. The Sydney River sculptures are a series of monumental scale structures throughout the shows honoring the area's long-standing music heritage as well as a strong history in the aluminum industry. Florence has been planning and preparing for our own installation in the series for many years. And it's my privilege today to offer this sculpture as a tribute of honor to our past local musical heroes as well as to those now and in the future. I know I'm not the only one proud to be here today. Our city council is equally excited to see this project to completion. Uh, I want to take this time. Uh, we're going to we're going to say goodbye to some of the honorees honored today. But I, I'm, I'm delighted that we have the opportunity to have uh, two individuals with us today. Dr. Carlos Handy is W.C. Handy's grandson. And our own Senator Bobby Denton here, and I couldn't be more pleased to be able to call him my friend. <laughs> now, at this time, I'm going to ask Billy Warren to come forward. Billy is our city historian. And I asked 1818, and our town was founded. A planned town on the, on the frontier is remarkable within itself but I will try to contain myself and not get too carried away. In 1821, just three years later, we were visited, the town was visited by a woman by the name of Anne Royale. She traveled home as a journalist, but she visited the frontier towns, and Florence was one of them. In her letter in 1821, she described the warehouses all along the, the bank of the river here. Because, as you know, our river was not navigable year-round until Wilson Dam was finished in 1925. So there were many times during the year that the goods being shipped here by boat couldn't even go any farther. So there were warehouses. The, the goods were offloaded, put into the warehouses, then taken to their destination. So how to visualize that, following the Native Americans and their being here? So, to this property specifically, I have to give uh, a nod to the Honorable John McKinley. He was Alabama's first uh, Justice of the Supreme Court. He lived here in Florence at the time. His house was right over there. <laughs> Where the fountain is, it's right over on the back side of the main property. Well, Anne Royale again, when she was here, she described this impressive home of uh, John McKinley and his family. In fact, she called it a mansion. But those of us who've read her letters, she tended to be a little overblown in her, in her descriptions. What she did say, and I love this, she visited Huntsville as well. But she said about the ladies of Florence that the ladies in Florence were much better looking than the women in Huntsville. And guess what? That's still true today, right? Anyway, back to John McKinley. He lived over there, his family, but he had a cow barn. They had cattle still, of course, uh, in those early days. Here, right here where we're standing and sitting. He had a cow barn, a cow barn right at what would be now the corner of Bluff Street and Court Street. And uh, all of this ground around it was labeled public, gr uh, public ground, and it had a public stream that was right up on that corner. You can follow the nod of my head. I don't want my paper to blow away, okay? But then 
Uh, that same cow barn was sold a couple of times, and a fellow by the name of John Rapier, who was an African American, he was later owner of that cow barn, and he sold it to the trustees of the Methodist Church, our downtown Methodist Church, in 1857, so it would be a meeting house for the local African American population. I'm talking about a church house. It was first simply known as, quote, the African Church, unquote. By 1859, just two years later, the church was known as Church Springs Methodist Episcopal Church. Here's a good, here's a wonderful thing to tell you. In 1866, just a few years later, the very first school for African American children in Florence opened in that church, that former cow barn. It was under the auspices of the Pittsburgh Freedmen's Aid Association, and it was still a church on Sundays, but a school during the week. By 1878, it appears that Church Springs Methodist Church, officially affiliated with the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AMA, and after purchase that church, after purchasing a factory building on the corner of what is now West Alabama Street in Court, a, a corner of the courthouse parking lot, uh, they, there was a factory, a factory, factory, and they began to meet in that factory building. But with, they replaced it with another building in 1895, and it continued to, to develop until today. It is known as the Greater St. Paul AMA Church, and it's on, on uh, uh, Cherokee Street. So, a brief history of all of that in a nutshell, and I conclude with this. With its very storied past, this property where you're standing and sitting will continue that historical narrative that I've summed up for you. It will continue that historical narrative by highlighting Florence's world-famous music history that began, and you know it and I know it, began as the Singing River. Thank you. Years that helped raise the funds and get this project on the ground. And this is my partner, David Anderson. He and Bill first started this project. But I'm here just to tell you briefly about Bill Matthews, our partner that we miss very much. We are honoring him today, not only dedicating this sculpture and this experience today to him and all his work, but this plaque to my left, when you're walking around the sculpture, you will see our tribute to him there as well. But I wanted you to know how it began briefly. Uh, Bill, this is his idea, and David and I are so proud to tell you that. But it happened this way. David was a walker. Now that means a serious walker because he trained here and then walked in countries around the world. He'd been to Ireland once before, but on one other trip to Ireland, he came across a checkpoint that was a place where people from the North and South Ireland that were in conflict would be able to check through and visit their relatives. But he noted the, the sorrow of that, the first trip, but the second trip that he went through, it was no longer there. What was there was became Bill's inspiration for this sculpture. There was a band that was sitting in the middle of this large courtyard, and there were musicians there. There were guitars and flutes and percussion and banjo, everything you could think of that would make some music or make a percussion sound. And around him were people, uh, couples that were dancing, children that were dancing and having a great time. And he saw that and previous to him going over there and seeing it, he and David had been looking for, knowing that they wanted four sculptures, one in each city, that they would find a symbol that would draw the community together. Well, this was it. This was the inspiration for Bill. He couldn't wait to get home and immediately call David. And they began to share what it might look like. And in the meantime, they did some research, as Warren alluded to, about the Tennessee River here. and. They went over the over our all, all of our history. We know that the Native Americans here referred to the river as the Singing River, 
but they heard a voice out of that river, a song as he went over the shoals and in different times of the seasons. So all of a sudden, it became clear to David and, and uh, Bill that this river is our link. It links all our cities. It links us together. And so they came up with the Singing River Sculpture. And we love that, and I think that everyone has expressed that to us. But anyway, we, we learned from that history and that it was a perfect introduction to what they wanted to do. There were two projects to finish, and Muscle Shows got their projects, and Florence gathered a steering committee that got together uh, to evaluate what they wanted and to select a sculpture for this, this Florence Singing River. So we've only used sculptures that are from Alabama, and we are honoring that heritage too, and in a big way today, I can tell you. Bill always referred to these sculptures as humongous. Every time you were in a conversation with him, he'd say, oh, it's got to be humongous. People have to notice it. When I was in Ireland, those things were 20 feet tall. Anyway, he had his heart set on this, and we have it today. And I'm gonna introduce now uh, David er uh, Anderson, and he will tell you some other things. Thank you. There are people in this audience that were here when all this music started at the uh, Georgia bus station and at the city drugstore. Bobby Denton was here, David Briggs is here, and uh, Spader Oliver is here. And they made it before, but they have been they were here from the beginning. And you see what? You see what they started and you see where that ended up. It's world famous. Talking about Bill and his hikes, he never came back that it, he didn't tell us without him saying anything about the music. He would run into somebody in these foreign countries that said, oh, you're from where the Muscle Shoals sound came from. You didn't know that, <laughs> but, but they did. I've got to go now and, and uh, go ahead and, and Thank some people. Does anybody done this kind of work? Know oh, that the people who are visible, the people that worked on it. There's dozens, if not hundreds, of people behind the scenes. Otherwise, it would never get done. The city employees, Florence, are top notch. We were impressed with their professionalism, and they were all. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I've got a list of all of them, but these are the ones that we work with the most. Steve, additionally, not with the city, but with organizations around the shoals, uh, I'd like to say thank you to Nancy Gaunch from the Music Preservation Society, Mary Settle Cooney, and was at the uh, Tennessee Valley Art Center, and also at the Art Center was Keith McMurtry. And Keith, Kept us straight as far as the funds coming in and going. I want to say thank you to Eric Newby. Who put the, I think he came up with a design that even the committee didn't didn't know exactly what we wanted. We we had an idea of what we wanted, and Eric fulfilled that. And his workmanship was just fantastic. The, as far as the, the commissioning of this project. Our commissioning committee was, at that time, Andy Patterson, who was on the city council at that time, uh, Professor Chin, who is director of galleries and professor of art at UNA, Dr. Elliot Knight, who is director of the state, Alabama State Council of Art, Selwyn Jones, one of our fine local musicians, and Libby Jordan, at that time, director of arts and museum for the city. And ex officio members of that group was Mayor Steve O, uh, Bill Matthews, Sandra Batters, and myself. Now, Mayor, are we ready to unwrap this? We've got, we got just a little bit more. I know you're excited. I know we've got lots of people to thank. I know, in particular, uh, this sculpture was paid for with private dollars, and we've got lots of people to thank for that. Our obligation as a city is to provide the location and the base. Before I move along, I want to be sure we recognize 
White Landing College, BH Craig Construction, uh, Bethlehem Equipment. Bethlehem was out here, put the sculpture up, and uh, you never seen one put up. That was quite, quite uh, an observation. And I know uh, David mentioned Chase McCluskey, he was an engineer in our engineering department. But this is his project. And he always got a big grin on his face when you ask him a question about it, and I couldn't be more pleased for that. Now, I'm going to read the honorees that were on the invitation. And if there's family member, if they're here, or our family member's here, I'd like you to stand. Well, obviously, W.C. Handy's not here, but we got a grandson. Tracy Sledge, Arthur Alexander, Gary Baker, Norbert Putnam, Barry Beckett, Jimmy Johnson, David Hood, Mike Hawkins, James Jordan, Paul Stafford, Rick Hall, Sam Phillips, Buddy Killer, Billy Sherrill, Kelso Hurston, Bobby Dent, Earl Green, Carl Montgomery, David Briggs, Dottie Fritz, Dan Pete, Holden, Terry Johnson, Jerry Kerrigan, Terry Woodford, Randy Poe, Walt Aldridge, Mark Darmore, Kevin Lamb, and Nancy Lee. The commemorative, uh, the, sorry, the commemorative plaque that serves the musicians who began their careers at Florence, Alabama, and they changed the world with their music of the 20th century. They became world famous with, with a unique style. Their talents are undisputed, and their contributions to our lives in Florence and the shows is valued. Their music and hit recordings are part of the very fabric of our lives today. The music you've been hearing today, and we'll hear if the unveiling is connected to the honorees listed on the invitation and the commemorative plaque. They have written, composed, accompanied, produced, published, and recorded. The music is a listening experience of the various genres and approach to music.